Let us have a prayer and we'll get into it. Father, may your name be glorified in our lives. May your son Jesus and you dwell in our hearts forever and always, Lord, as we just sung. We love you. We give our lives, we give our minds, we give our hearts to you. May you work on the aspects of our lives that still need working on. May you purify us where we still need purifying. And may you help us to reflect your image more and more each and every day. Father, I again commit my mind, my tongue, my lips to you now. May you speak to and through me, Lord. And may the words be a blessing to your people. And uh, may they lead your people to have more peace and more appreciation of your love and your gift of salvation. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you can see this morning, we'll be looking at guilty conscience and dead works. Guilty conscience and dead works. Allow me to begin by reading a passage. From Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, it says, The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation, until the time of the cross. So the author is saying that the old covenant God instituted, uh, uh, it, 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 it was a system, it had a system in which the worshiper had to do or went through certain things to receive forgiveness for the sins that he did. The worshiper, in that system, the worshiper would offer sacrifices to God in order to receive forgiveness, in order to deal with their sins. That was the way to be accepted and forgiven with the Lord. That was the way how they did it in the Old Covenant. Now, the, the author is pointing to a deficiency in that system. He's saying, look, the, the, the worshiper in that system, he, he took sacrifices and offerings to God in order to be forgiven. However, even though he was forgiven, even though he went through the ritual, even though he obeyed the instructions of God, these sacrifices and offerings could not cleanse his conscience. Right? That's what it's saying. That's what the author is saying. There was a deficiency in the old system. There was a deficiency in the old covenant. The old covenant was made of types and shadows. They were not the reality. They were types and shadows to teach the worshiper, to teach God's people the lessons, the realities that would be fulfilled in Christ. And the author is saying that while these worshipers were going through the types and the shadows, they could be forgiven in the sight of God, but it could not impart to them, it could not give them a cleansing of the conscience. Right? That's what the verse says. Notice what we read in chapter 10, verses 1 onward. He says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon to perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible, it's just not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Again, the author is pointing to the deficiencies, highlighting a deficiency. He's saying, look, in this old system, God provided offerings and sacrifices that the worshiper could go through in order to receive forgiveness and in order to be accepted with God. However, these sacrifices and offerings could not make the comer there unto perfect. It just could not perfect them. It could not do what God intended or wanted for his people. Right? That types and shadows could not accomplish what God wanted accomplished. It, it could not make them perfect, which, according to the context in chapter 9, could not make their conscience perfect. Now he says, and if it made them perfect, wouldn't the sacrifices have ceased? That's what he says. 
He says, but the fact that the sacrifice is kept being repeated every year and every year and every year is an evidence that it did not and could not accomplish what God wanted accomplished. The fact that the sacrifice is being repeated every year, it was a reminder to the people of their sins. Because the people every morning and every evening and every day and every year and so forth kept seeing the sacrifices being offered. The sacrifices reminded them of their sins. Their sins reminded them of their guilt. Hence their conscience was always heavy, never had that peace. The guilty feeling was always there even though they were forgiven and accepted. Are you with me? That's what the author is saying. That was what was happening in the Old Testament. Uh, where am I now? The old covenant provisions only dealt with legal cleansing. Legally, it made the worshipper forgiven. Legally, it made the worshipper accepted. But personally and practically on the inside, the worshipper did not have a clean conscience. Whatever that means, whatever the author means by it. The way I would understand it is that the, the, the worshiper continued to have a guilty conscience, continued to remember his sins and feel guilty about it. I might be wrong, you might have a different understanding, that's fine. Whatever it is, according to the author, these rituals, sacrifices and offerings they went through could not make them perfect according to the conscience. Legally, it cl cleansed them, but practically it didn't. In other words, the old covenant practices and rituals, the sacrifices and offerings could not fix the inner man. It only dealt with the outer man. The inner man was never at peace. Uh, now, why is it important to have a clean conscience? Well, to understand why is, it, why is it important to have a clean conscience, we have to understand what is conscience to begin with. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a definition of con uh, conscience, what conscience is. I couldn't find it. But I looked at some scientific articles to see what, what is conscience. I think we're all somewhat familiar with what conscience is, but it's good to put some, some, some words to it. And here is what this, whatever, uh, I can't remember the source of this one. Uh, some scientific article how it defied conscience. Conscience is the highest authority and evaluates information to determine the quality of an action, good or evil, fair or unfair, and so on. We are all familiar with that, right? That's our conscience. You can deceive people, but you can't deceive yourself. The conscience is that part of you that God instilled in you that it's like it's part of you, but it's separate from you in a way. Every person who has done something wrong, he knows that it's wrong before he does it. There is something on the inside of him. There is a voice inside of him that tells him, don't do it. Just don't do that, man. Don't lie. Don't hide it. Don't put it in your pocket. Don't walk away. Say something. That's your conscience telling you what to do, differentiating between good and bad, between evil and good. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us that those people that don't have the law, God will judge them by a different standard. Here is what he says. He says, For what the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Your conscience will judge you. Even if you don't know God's instructions, even if you don't know God's will, God will say, fine, I will not judge you by my standard. I'm going to reveal to you your own conscience. Before you did such and such, deep down inside you, you knew it's wrong. Did you not? Here is your conscience testifying against you. It's as if, imagine, as if your conscience will take upon itself a different person and says, yes, I told you. Didn't I tell you? Well, yes, you did. So you knew what you're doing is wrong. Yes, I did. That's going to be your judge. Or you knew that what you're doing is right. Yes, I did. That's going to be your judge. Right? The conscience is that part of us that, that holds us accountable to our actions and our thoughts. So the conscience is a very important, it's a very crucial part of the makeup of man. 
it directly impacts our everyday quality of life. Many people lose sleep because of a guilty conscience, right? We've all been there once upon a time. You've done something, said something, you're feeling bad about it, and you can't sleep at night. Well, that's your conscience keeping you up. <laughs> Many people have their health destroyed because of a guilty conscience. The conscience plays a major important part in our lives. As a matter of fact, in the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church used the conscience of the people, the guilty conscience of the people, to make money. You know, it's, it's, it's sinners seeking a way to be accepted with God, seeking forgiveness, having a guilty conscience. The church, through their theology, Catholic Church, through their wicked theology, use the guilty conscience of the people, tell them, look, you've got this guilty conscience. The way you can be forgiven, the way you get peace for that conscience is give me money. I'll sell you forgiveness. Or go to the priest. Tell him every little detail of everything bad that you did. He will, ups, whatever the word, absolute your sins or whatever it is, give you, give you absolution. Right? So the Catholic Church used the guilty conscience of people to make money. Martin Luther almost killed himself because of a guilty conscience. Notice what he says. He says, my conscience could never achieve certainty, but was always in doubt and said, you have not done this correctly. You were not contrite enough. You omitted this in your confession. Therefore, the longer I tried to heal my uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience with human traditions, the more uncertain, weak, and troubled I continually made it. Seeking healing for his guilty conscience through human traditions, through Catholic traditions, through Catholic rituals, almost killed him and could not clear his conscience. All to no avail. His guilty conscience robbed him of peace and joy. And Paul tells us all the sacrifices and offerings in the Old Covenant could not make the comer, the worshiper in the Old Covenant, perfect as far as the conscience is concerned. They tried and tried again. They repeatedly tried to offer sacrifices and so forth, but he couldn't. Why? Paul says because the sacrifices were a, were a continual reminder of their sin. You see, both God and Satan can impact your life, your everyday life, through your conscience. By giving you a guilty conscience, you will not have peace. You, you can't do your job. You won't be able to enjoy the day. You'll have a beautiful sunny day, but to you it'll appear like cloudy and miserable because of your guilty conscience. Or you're going to be walking, you might be walking in a, in a snowy, rainy, cloudy, but to you it appears like it's sunny and beautiful and what a glorious day because of a pure conscience you have in your heart. You sleep like a baby if you have a pure conscience. Or you sleep like another baby if you have a guilty conscience. Sleep for an hour and cry for an hour. <laughs> Depends which conscience you have determines which baby you are, right? Luther said, such an evil beast and wicked devil is conscience. For all authors, sacred and profane, have depicted, depicted this monster in horrible fashion. A guilty conscience can rob you of peace and assurance, can rob you of a beautiful life that God has for you. It destroys your spiritual growth and hinders your coming boldly before God because of a guilty conscience. And at the same time, your peace is dependent on your clear conscience. A good walk with the Lord is based on a clear conscience. We read in the Bible, uh, I try my best to have a clear conscience in whatever I do for God or for people. Martin Luther said, where could there be a higher or greater joy than in a happy, secure, and fearless, fearless conscience, a conscience that trusts in God and fears neither the world nor the devil? So as you can see, the conscience is a very important part or aspect of our makeup. If you have a guilty conscience, you're not going to enter into the peace of God. And many times, the theology that we believe leads us to have a guilty conscience. And you never enter into the peace of God because of a guilty conscience that is, a, that is the result of a false theology. And not until you change your theology will your conscience be cleared and hence you can enter into God's peace. Now, how 
Or has God provided a way in the new covenant for us to have a clear conscience? Notice what the author says. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. The sacrifice in the old covenant purified the flesh, the outer man. It couldn't purify the inner man, right? He goes on to say, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. God has provided a way to cleanse your conscience. And it is through the blood of Christ. Now we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at three terminologies from this verse. One, ashes of a heifer. What is that? Two, dead works. What is that? And three, the blood of Christ. Ashes of a heifer. Where does that come from? In the Old Testament, God instructed his people. He said, I want you to take a red heifer without blemish. I want you to take her outside the camp. You slay her. You kill her. Right? The, the priest will take blood and sprinkle it seven times towards the, 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 the camp or the temple, whatever it was. And then I want you to add some spices, whatever it is, to, it, to the body. And I want you to burn it. And then I want you to collect the ashes and you put them in a bucket or in a jar or in a clean place outside the camp. And when someone is ceremonially unclean, he will go outside the camp and someone that is clean will sprinkle him with the ashes mixed with water and then that unclean person will become clear because he has been sprinkled by these ashes. Right? Here it is. Let me read for you a, a portion of that passage. It says in Numbers 19, and the clean persons shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bath himself in water and shall be clean at evening. But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. You look up the chapter, read in the context, you get the information that I told you to, to, to save time. The point is, when a person is unclean, he needed to be sprinkled with what water, it says? Water of separation. Okay, why? Because when a person is unclean, he is not allowed to enter into the camp, neither is he allowed to enter into the temple. Meaning, when a person is unclean, he cannot come in the presence of the Lord. Meaning, his uncleanliness separated between him and the Lord, right? Now, the solution for that separation between you and the Lord is to be sprinkled with the water of separation. That is made up of the ashes of the red heifer mixed with water. Weird ritual, but God instructed it, right? All right. So, in other words... The ashes of the heifer qualified the unclean and separated person to come in the presence of the Lord. Yes? Okay. Now, the author says, For if the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ purify your conscience? The ashes of the cow cleanse the person externally it legally allowed the person to come in the presence of god but internally it could not cleanse his conscience the author is contrasting the ashes of the cow with its effect with the blood of christ and its effect and he's saying the blood of christ is better the blood of christ will cleanse your conscience so uh, I think I have it here. He's contrasting the ashes of the heifer versus the blood of Christ, the purifying of the flesh versus the purifying of the conscience. In other words, legally, these sacrifices made the worshippers worthy to come before God, but internally it didn't fix him. However, the blood of Christ is much greater. It cleanses you the on the inside, not only legally allows you to come before God, but it allows you to come before God with a clean conscience. It cleanses your conscience. Why? Because the blood of Christ is a finished work. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Now, the interesting thing is that he says that it will cleanse your conscience from what? From dead works. 
from dead works. What are dead works? The Bible, the New Covenant, talks about three types of works. I'll have them here in front of you. It talks about good works. These are works that God has ordained that He does in us. It talks about wicked works. God didn't ordain them, and we do them, and some of us do them anyway. The devil does them through us. And then it talks about dead works. And my understanding of dead works, these dead works, they're not good, but they're not bad. They are in between. What do I mean by that? They are works that I have assumed that I need to do in order to qualify to come before God. They are good works that I have made a condition I need to fulfill in order to qualify to come before God. For example, I need to pray more. I need to read the Bible more. I need to help the poor more. I need to give more Bible studies. I need to preach more. Because of a burdened conscience, because of a guilty conscience, so many of us Christians, we end up adopting works that the Bible calls dead works, thinking that these works, they good in and of themselves, they sound good, thinking that if I do those works, I will qualify myself to come before God. I will silence my conscience. Have, have anybody, you don't have to put your hand up, but I'll put both my hands up. Have anybody experienced this where you think, you know what, I, man, I got to do something. I go to church and whew, I feel good. I feel good now. It's like I silence this part of me or, or I preach a sermon and whew, now, now, I, now I can relax for a couple of days. I, like my conscience is, is feel clear or, or I give money to help the poor and it quiets my conscience a bit or, or whatever other good work. And it's good. We do to silence our conscience. And a few days later, we get this nagging, guilty feeling again. And then we have to do something else good to silence that. I've got news for you. The Bible talks about those works. And it calls them dead works. They're not bad works. They're in a way good works. But they're dead. Because they don't achieve nothing. I think I need to do them, but the reality is I never accomplish them good enough. They're not bad of, of themselves. But the problem is that I decided that I need to do these works in order to qualify before God. But the reality is I can never do them good enough. I pray, but I never feel I prayed enough. Anybody been there? I write books. Oh yeah, I've been there. I'm still there maybe. But I never feel I've written enough. I preach sermons. But I never feel I've preached enough. I travel to visit the saints. But I never feel I've done enough. I help the poor and I give this and I give that. But I never feel I've given enough. It's like a, a, a jolly dead vicious circle that we enter in. Because we have theologically placed ourselves in that position thinking that I need to accomplish these things and I need to go do them good enough in order to solace my conscience because only then and only then I'm qualified and accepted in the sight of God. And the reality is you will never ever do them good enough. You will never do them good enough. This places us in a predicament because we go around doing good works to temporarily solace our conscience, let alone to be surprised a few hours later, a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, we're getting that nagging, guilty feeling again to do them. It's, it's, it's a predicament. I've established rules. I've put conditions to come before God thinking I can fulfill them because they're easy. I mean, surely prayer is easy, right? But why in the world can I never feel that I prayed enough? So I, 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 I think I can get them. It's like they, they, they're right there, Lord. They, they're easy to get to, but I'm just not getting there. And failure, failing to do them is even deadlier than the works themselves. 
The works themselves are dead in that they're dead. They, they don't accomplish anything. But the failure to do them, because we all fail to, to get there, to feel that fully satisfied in them, even gives us a worse conscience, even more guilty. It's a vicious trip. And you know what's worse than that? Is when you think you actually did them. And you think that you've accomplished them. And you put on that suit and the necktie and you walk straight up and you're all proud of yourself that I've, I've made it now. I've, I've accom I'm accepted. I've done. I have not sinned today. Bravo. Bravo. Let, let, let's analyze this a bit. What is it that created that separation between you and God to begin with? Sin. What is it that gave you the satisfaction that you're accepted now? Your dead works. So are you saying that you have just replaced the works of Christ with your works? Are you saying that you have just bridged the gap between you and God by your own works and your own accomplishment? Aren't you just of, haven't you just offended God in that thinking and in that mentality and you have made the grace of God of no effect in your life because you have done it on your own? The only way to bridge the gap that sin has create, created is repentance and coming to the cross. And the moment you think that by your dead works, whatever good they are, these dead works, you have bridged that gap, you have just offended God. So it's a vicious circle. Once you enter into that circle and you set those rules of the dead works that you need to accomplish, whatever how long the skirt is or how, how good the food is or, or how many hours of prayer or, or I must have my morning and evening worship and if I don't have it, I'm doomed and, and I gotta have it, then I have a clear conscience I can go to work now and whatever it is, I'm not condemning these things, but I will condemn them, I will smash them to pieces if you put them as a condition. It's a vicious circle because one, you, if you're honest with yourself, you will never do them good enough. You will never get to that peace. You will only make your conscience worse. Two, if you think you've done them, you've offended God. Is it a wonder that the Bible says they are dead works? Now, the interesting thing is that it says, it says the blood of Christ will cleanse your conscience, not from sin, but from dead works. God's remedy to heal your conscience and to fix this problem of dead works is the blood of Christ. Now, what about the ashes? What do the ashes of a heifer testify? How are they linked to the blood of Christ? Question, can you burn ashes? No. So ashes are a symbol of a finished work. Ashes of a cow represent a cow that has been chosen, a cow that has been accepted, an offering that has been made, an offering that has been accepted, an offering that has been burnt, the ashes have been collected. In other words, the ashes of a cow represents a done deal, a finished work. It's already, the sacrifice has been chosen, has been accepted, has been offered. God accepted it. It's right there. Just go use it. That tells us why it's a type of the blood of Christ. Because the blood of Christ speaks of a finished work. Remember what we saw last night? It is finished. The blood of Christ is a testimony of a finished and accomplished work. It's not something you need to add to. It's not something you still you need to accomplish. It's not an ongoing event. It's a finished event. It's the blood of Christ. It's a finished work. All what you have to do is accept it. The ashes are a statement of a finished and accepted work. And I think I have it here. The blood of Christ is a memorial of his finished work. In other words, the blood of Christ is enough to restore us to full fellowship with God, to be fully accepted, to come boldly before His throne, and we have no need to do any dead works. You don't need them. That's why the blood of Christ will cleanse your conscience from the need of doing dead works. You don't need to beat yourself and fast and pray and, and, and confess your sins to the priest and, and give alms and whatnot to be accepted. 
if you want to do those things, great. Go help the poor and pray. Of course, it's commendable. It's great. But if you think these things will commend you to God, mate, you have entered the vicious circle. You know, let's say you lost a ring and you go looking for it. Lost a ring. Lost something. A watch, a ring, a key. And you go looking for it and you find it. What's the first thing that you do? Yes. There's something you do before that. There was something you do before that. You stop looking. And then you thank God, right? If you have come to the blood of Christ, it's a finished work. That which is lost has been found already. Why are you still looking? Why are we still looking for a way to be accepted with God? Why are we still looking for a way to, 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 to fix that separation between us and God? Why? Is it finished or is it not? Did he find a way or did he not? Did he author a way or did he not? If he did, stop looking. Just receive it and enjoy it. Amen? So have you accepted the blood of Christ or are you still looking? Jesus said, Come unto me. Here it is, you can take a picture. Je Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and have a laden, and I will give you rest. Yes, burdened with sin. Yes, labor. Uh, I understand all that. But don't forget Jesus was talking to Jews. Pharisees, Sadducees, who were laboring to do rituals in order to be accepted with God. They were laboring, doing dead works in order to be accepted with God. And Jesus said, look, come unto me, all ye that labor and have laid, and I will give you rest. I found that ring, man. Stop looking. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. The blood of Christ speaks of a finished work, a victory already won, an accomplished mission, a done deal right we read in hebrews having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which we, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. The blood of Jesus is enough. What he did for you and me 2,000 years ago is enough to unite us with God. We don't need to add anything to it. The author says, let us draw near with a true heart. What does that mean? Not with a doubting heart. Not with a heart that is unsure. Come with a true heart. A heart that is sure. A heart that is confident. Not half believing and half don't. In full assurance of faith. What does that mean? In full confidence. That Christ accomplished work. And God's will for you. Has been done. Come without wavering to him. Come knowing that the work has been finished. Come knowing that you are accepted in the Son. Come knowing that you are adopted as a son and a daughter in the family of God. Come knowing, believing in full assurance that there is a crown of life for you. Come knowing, believing that you have been forgiving. He says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Don't come with a guilty conscience. We need to not only profess that we accept the sacrifice of God, of Christ, we need to actually accept it, actually, actually allow the blood of Christ to cleanse our conscience. Look, man, you're either a child of God or you aren't. And if God says you're his child, you either believe him or you don't. If you don't believe him, you will have a guilty conscience for the rest of your life. If you believe him, then stop having an evil conscience. Stop having a conscience that is plagued by all the evil things that you have done in the past. And recognize and realize that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That all things have gone away. Behold, all things have become new. 
that he has forgiven you, that you're accepted. He says, and our bodies washed with pure water. We have been cleansed just like the priests were washed and cleansed. You have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. You don't need to do anything else in order to qualify. And then he goes on to say in verse 23, no, sorry, it's here already on the screen. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Cling to the reality of who you are in Christ without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Why should you depend on it? Why should you cling? Why should you not doubt? Why should you have assurance? Why? Because I am faithful? Because he is faithful. So many of us Christians, we, 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 we place our dependence on our faithfulness, on my faith, on my love to God, on my obedience. I've got news for you. Your love will falter. Your faith will falter. Your obedience will falter. Our assurance is in His faithfulness, in His love. That is our only confidence. When we understand that the blood of Christ is enough, that it represents a finished work, not a work in progress, that it represents a gift accepted, an eternal life freely given to you, that it represents reconciliation with God and qualifies you to come into His presence, then and only then will you stop attempting to quiet your guilty conscience by that works. So long you don't believe it, you will continue to live this vicious life having a guilty conscience trying to silence it by dead works, doesn't matter how good they are. And when this takes place, our conscience will stop playing tricks on us and then and only then can you serve God. Notice what he goes on to say. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve God? the living God. The only way to be able to serve the living God is when you have your conscience clear. So long your conscience is guilty, you're not really, really serving God. You're more so serving your conscience, trying to silence it. With such confidence and peace in our heart, you will have a true relationship with God you will enter into that peace with God. Your faith will grow, your goodness will grow, your obedience will grow. Having a, you're, resting. you're resting. Having a clean conscience is directly linked with spiritual growth. Notice what Peter says. But those who don't grow in these blessings are blind. They cannot see clearly what they have. They have forgotten that they were cleansed from their past sins. The reason many people are not growing spiritually is because they continue to hold on to a, clear conscience, and to a guilty conscience. They have not accepted the implications of the finished work of Christ, of the blood of Christ. These are my words. Your beliefs control your conscience and your conscience controls your peace and happiness. As a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. Your belief controls your conscience and your conscience controls your peace. You want to fix your peace problem? Stop trying to achieve it by doing dead works. Address your false beliefs. Start believing the word of God. Start accepting who you are in Christ. In a sermon preached in 1519, Luther said, one must know how one stands with God. If the conscience is to be joyful and be able to stand. For when a person doubts this and does not steadfastly believe that he has a gracious God, then he actually does not have a gracious God. As he believes, so he has. Therefore, no one can know that he is in grace and that God is gracious toward him except through faith. If he believes it, he is saved. If he does not believe it, he is damned. For this confidence and good conscience is the real, basically good faith, which the grace of God works in us. If our beliefs, if our theology will continue to be messed up, thinking that I must include my works in the equation to be accepted with God, guess what? 
you will continue having a God of that sort. You will continue having a guilty conscience. But the moment you open your eyes and you start realizing who God really is, you start realizing the acceptance that God has for you, the inclusivity that is in God. You start accepting and believing what God has done for you, the finished work of Christ. Then and only then will you see God in His true light. And will you rejoice and enter into this peace. Now, I've got a few moments left. What led me to this study? My own personal experience has led me to this study. Not from a theological perspective, from a doomed practical life that almost got me to walk away from my, this gospel work last year. For years, I had this guilty, nagging conscience. Not because of anything bad I did, not that type of guilt, but that guilty, nagging conscience that I'm, I'm not good enough. I just haven't done enough. I, I haven't preached enough. I haven't taught enough. I haven't written enough. I haven't given enough. Whatever it is, I haven't kept the Sabbath good enough. I haven't prayed good enough. You name it, I've been there. Maybe you guys are saints, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you my experience. I had this guilty conscience for a long time. And towards the end of last year, Things happen. I won't bore you with that long story, but things happen and led me to decide, you know what? I'm going to have to slow down on my traveling. I don't want to travel. I can't travel as much. For whatever family reasons, I decided that. And I'm going to pull out of online world for a while. It just, I, I was having a burnout pretty much in long, ter long story short. I was having a burnout last year. I was ready to walk away. That's it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to slow down on my travel. I can't travel as much. I'm pulling out of the Zoom. And because of my guilty conscience that was telling me you haven't done enough, well, now I thought, hang on. I wasn't doing enough as it is. Now if I'm going to travel less, well, then I definitely won't be doing enough. And if I'm not doing enough, well, I definitely don't deserve the blessing that I have. I don't deserve the calling that I have. I'm telling you, really my thought process and I thought you know what I'm gonna get ahead of the Lord in this one because I know I won't be doing enough and because I know that because I'm not doing enough I don't deserve the blessing I know the blessing is gonna stop now I have a family and I need to support my family and I thought you know what before God's blessing stops I'm gonna change my career I'm gonna go ahead of the Lord so I trick him before he tricks me type of thing, you know. I secure myself before he stops blessing me so I can provide for my family. Carnal thinking, yeah, well, welcome. <laughs> so I started looking for other work. I applied for the police. Because my, my thought process is, you know what, I don't want to go do a job just nine to five, just get paid for the work I'm doing, work for money. I don't want that. I want to work for a greater cause. I've been doing for this past 20 years working for a greater cause, I, I got to find a substitute. I thought, you know what, the police force, at least I'll be helping someone, giving security to someone, whatever it is. I'm doing something greater than just a paycheck. My thought process. I applied for the police. I had an interview with them. And, uh, and in the interview, the guy that's, two of them, the guy that's interviewing me and a lady, the guy said, at the end, he said, okay, I might see you on the road. You know, I thought, great. I'm, well, it's good news, I'm accepted. A week passed, and then after that, I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, I don't know, man. If it's not your will, just shut the door. A day or two days later, I receive an email. You have not been accepted. You've been rejected. I'm like, okay, praise God. The, the, the door shut. Um, now, in Australia, when you apply to the police and you, you're rejected, you are not allowed to reapply for another six months. You can't just submit another appeal. You have to wait six months. I thought, okay, well, now... I've got six months, I'll wait till whatever it is, June, July this year, maybe pass, six months will pass. Maybe I'll see how I'm doing, maybe I'll reapply. Um, and in the meantime, I met this friend of mine, an ex-Pentecostal pastor that had left ministry and is doing social work. I thought, you know what, I'll, I might as well do social work. 
Amar as well, study social work. I applied university to study a bachelor in social work. They replied to me and they said, look, you already have a bachelor degree. Why waste your time? Just do masters. It's shorter and higher qualifications. I'm like, okay, I applied for masters. I got accepted. And here is the lady that is in charge emailing me like, when are you coming? Can you come? We're starting next week. You know, just come and putting the pressure on. I thought, you know what? I'm accepted. I'm going to start the thing. I don't even know what it is. Well, let me get together with this friend of mine so he can tell me a bit what social work is. So I met with him for dinner, and I believe God spoke through him that night. And, and I told him, look, man, I applied, got accepted for masters. Well, what is it? Can you tell me a bit of what, what I'm getting into? And, and he, said, he said, look, God told Abraham, look to the east, to the west, whatever your footsteps, I will give it to you. He says, and God is telling you, you want to join the police, you want to do social work, you want to grow your home church, whatever it is that you want to do, God will give it to you. But why are you doing what you're doing? I wasn't ready for that question. I sat back and I'm thinking, why in the world I'm doing what I'm doing? Yeah. Why am I running away? Yeah. Long story short, after analyzing it, I came to the conclusion that I told you. It started with this guilty feeling, thinking I need to earn the blessing. I need to do. I mean, God is blessing me. He has called me. He's giving me the privilege of flying here and, and speaking to people that are making a trip to come hear me. Who am I? So you guys leave home and come to listen to me. I don't think much of me. But God has given me a, a, this, this beautiful blessing and I don't deserve it. So I always thought I need to earn it. I need to pay the Lord back. And when I decided I can't pay as much as I've been paying, well, I don't deserve it. So I started looking for a way out. And that's when I decided, you know what? I actually don't need a change. I just need a break. So I decided to take a break. Now, funny enough, when I decided to take a break, I received an email from the police <laughs> saying, look, we started a new program. It's a multicultural program for people like yourself who come from a different background <laughs> other than Australian, as in you're, you're, you're uh, an immigrant. So I called them. I said, look, but I, I've been rejected. I can't apply for another six months. They said, no, 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 don't worry about it. You come, you start, do this course six weeks. You finish on Friday. Straight away on the Monday after it, you will start the police course, which goes for eight months, and then you, you'll start working. <laughs> I'm like... Now you tell me. <laughs> I said, no, no, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to do it. So God in his mercy, he gave me long enough leash to run a bit, you know, think you're, you're, you're smart and think you're free. Okay, go run, 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 run. Yeah, finish running, finish. Okay, come, come back. Eh? So this that works, I know by experience. I lived in them for years. It burnt me out. Because I could never get to the place when I feel, where I feel that I've done enough to earn what God has blessed me with. And after burning out, I came back to the realization what I known and should have believed long time ago, that the blood of Christ is enough. That I'm not blessed because I deserve it. I'm blessed because I don't deserve it. But because He's gracious and He's faithful. My blessing comes because of His grace, His love, His mercy, and His compassion, not because I deserve it. Will I falter? Do I fall short? Most absolutely I fall short. I don't deserve what I have. So, I appeal to you. We looked yesterday from three different theological perspectives at the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus, at the free gift at the eternal life that is freely given, the salvation that is freely given, righteousness that is freely given to us theologically. Today I'm giving you my own practical experience, how I walked the other side, trying to earn it. I burnt out, I almost walked away from the calling that has, God has called me because I could not pay enough. Now I appeal to you, don't do the same mistake. If you are on this dead works trip, get out, man, get off that horse before it leads you to a burnout where I was or even something worse. We need to understand and believe that the blood of Christ is enough. It is sufficient. We are accepted. We're loved. We're wanted. We're needed. 
we're invited to come boldly before the throne, not because we deserve it, because He is worthy. He has finished the work. Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening. Let us close with a prayer. Loving Father, Lord, I want to thank you with all my heart for not treating me the way I deserve to be treated, for not treating us all the way we deserve to be treated, but for treating us the way we needed to be treated. Thank you for being merciful and loving and gracious. Thank you for this redemption and eternal life that you give us for free. Thank you for making us righteous when, when we didn't even know what righteousness is. Thank you for giving us a crown of life when, when we were still wondering if there is such a thing. Lord, help us to believe the glorious news. Help us to believe how good your heart is. Help us to believe how gracious you are, Lord, so we can allow you to live fully in our life so our life will testify of the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus, the freedom to live a life that glorifies you. This is my prayer, Lord. I pray for each and every one here as we go our separate ways. May you continue to keep us close to you. May you bless God and lead and use us as instruments in your hands. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.